nice to see everyone and, and, uh, and meet you today. And um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, or just basically an introduction to the types of analyses that we're going to work on uh, at this workshop. Um, and um, all of the content is open access and can be accessed and reused online uh, for these workshops in general. So, um, so the, the main um, motivation for all the analyses methods that we're going to learn about at this workshop is that we have an, ex we've done an experiment and it's generated a lot of genes that are somehow interesting. Um, so maybe we um, measure gene expression in tumor samples versus normal or uh, when, you know, two conditions were, we compared and we found thousands of genes that were differentially expressed between the conditions. Or maybe we did a genome-wide association study and we found a bunch of SNPs that were associated with a phenotype and those SNPs are linked to genes. And when we look at the list of genes, there's hundreds of them. Um, uh, or maybe we um, did a proteomics experiment where we did a pull down of a protein of interest and we found a whole bunch of proteins that bound to that protein and now we want to know something about about those so um, in general uh, the idea of pathway and network analysis is to help us automate that um, analysis um, and you know most of the time when we get these big list of genes the first question is okay well what is this telling me about the experiment or the system that I'm studying um, what's interesting about these genes and um, a, a very common way of answering this question is to find out if they're enriched in known functions of genes. And these functions are frequently things like biological pathways. So we might find that there, instead of thinking about thousands of genes that are differentially expressed between tumor and normal, we find that there are a handful of important pathways that are ex differentially expressed or active between tumor and normal. So the way that we um, find these um, is that we try to find out if they're, um, if we have this big list of genes, if there are any uh, functions in those genes uh, associated with those genes that are enriched more than we would expect by chance. So if we had a hundred genes and half of them were involved in the cell cycle, and we know that if you look at the whole genome, there's only 5% of genes that are involved in the cell cycle, then you know we would normally expect if this was a random, uh, you know, if we just got a random list of genes that only 5% of the 100 genes would be in, you know, part of the cell cycle. But if half of our genes in our list are part of the cell cycle, then that's 10 times more than we would expect. And you can calculate a p-value associated with that. And, and then that helps you um, basically say that it's, you know, uh, probably there's something interesting, the cell cycle happening in, in my experiment. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen such a strong enrichment which is very unlikely to occur by chance. So, um, so the way that we do this is we, you know, we have some way of generating gene lists and we'll talk about that. Um, we have prior knowledge about cellular processes, pathways, protein complexes, other types of functions. And then we analyze that data and we out output some interesting um, system that is uh, enriched. And this saves time compared to um, approaches that you'd have to do if you didn't have automated software. And so the traditional approach would be that you look through that gene list and you learn about every gene you can. And that re will probably requires a lot of literature searching. Um, and so it's uh, a big time saving approach. Okay. So pathway and network analysis um, in general helps us gain mechanistic insight into omics data. Um, so we might be able to identify our master regulator or an interesting drug target or characterize pathways that are active in a sample. And um, I uh, usually define pathway network analysis as any type of analysis that involves any kind of pathway or network information, which you already know about. Um, and there are many of these analyses methods out there, but the most commonly applied ones are ones that help interpret lists of genes. Um, and you know, uh, the most popular of those is uh, pathway enrichment analysis, but many others are useful and we'll cover a few um, in this workshop. So most of the rest of the, um, so, so next I'm gonna just go through a number of different um, examples of pathway analysis uh, of different types of data. So you can get a sense of the, um, you know, interesting results that you can get from applying these types of analysis methods. So the first example 
uh, is about autism spectrum disorder. So um, autism spectrum disorder has a important genetic component. Um, it has, you know, over 60% concordance in identical twin studies. Um, and, um, you know, at, uh, at the time that this, uh, so, so this um, project that I'm going to talk about was published a number of years ago in 2010. Um, at the time, there were about, you know, five to 15 percent of the genetics can be explained by rare gene disorders. But at, at the time, people had kind of started to realize that um, a lot of the uh, autism spectrum disorder phenotype could be explained by de novo copy number variants. So they'd started discovering these. And um, so Steve Scherer's lab at the Hospital for Sick Children, um, whose who's main focus is studying this autism spectrum disorder uh, and, and the genetics of this, this disorder, decided to do a genome wide, uh, decided to look at copy, de, novo, de novo copy number variants um, to better explain the variants in the, in the phenotype. And so they um, took about a thousand cases and a thousand controls. Um, and they applied um, SNP arrays to genotype all the individuals. These SNP arrays measure the presence or absence of SNPs across the genome. And um, because he was his group was interested in copy number variants, what you can do with these SNP arrays is you can look for um, SNPs that are all you know highly detected or not detected at all in a kind of string across the genome, and that can help identify copy number variants. So if if you don't detect a SNP, a single SNP, well, that probably means that you know maybe there's you know the other the other another uh, version of that SNP is is present. But if you have a whole string of them, like hundreds of them, that are all next to each other, like all the consecutive SNPs on the genome are all not detected, uh, probably the explanation is that that part chunk of the genome is missing and that's a copy number deletion. And everybody on earth has copy number deletions and also amplifications. So those are detected by seeing the same kind of pattern in the opposite direction. So from SNP arrays, you can identify all these copy number or infer all of these copy number uh, variants. Um, and they were interested in the rare ones because those are more likely to be de novo and um, more likely to cause a serious phenotype. Um, and so they, they took the ones that were present in less than 1% of the population. Um, and there were some copy number variants or regions of the genome that were affected by copy number variants that were associated with the uh, autism spectrum disorder cases. Um, and, um, but that only identified about 10 genes. Um, so it wasn't really a lot of additional information compared to what they knew. So um, what we did was um, do a, a pathway analysis. So um, we took the um, um, the copy number variants <laughs> as a whole, and we asked if any pathways as a whole were affected by copy number variants. So let's say we take a pathway like um, uh, cell proliferation, and we find that it has 100 genes, and we ask how many individuals are uh, have a copy number variant gain or deletion in one of the genes in that pathway. And if a single gene in that pathway was affected, we say, okay, this pathway is affected in this individual. And then we do that for all the individuals, and we um, count up the number of individuals of the cases that are affected and count up the number of individuals that are affected in that pathway in the controls, and we compare them um, with the statistical test that can tell us if there's um, a stronger association with the cases. Um, there's more uh, of this pathway affect, more individuals have affected, uh, having copy number variants that affect this pathway in the cases than the controls. And that actually painted a, a very rich picture of pathways that are um, uh, affected or associated with autism spectrum disorder. So all these little circles represent pathways and the color represents the association, how strongly enriched um, the pathway is, like, you know, how different the numbers are between cases and controls. Um, and the um, mostly the pathways were affected by, by gene deletions or uh, genome region deletions. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so, so all of these circles are kind of 
those pathways. The color is representing the strength of the association with cases. The size of the circle is the number of pathway, the number of genes in the pathway. And these little labels are all the pathway names. And then we there was a lot of pathways, so we grouped them into bubbles here and then labeled the bubbles, and that kind of reduced the complexity of all the labeling that we would have to do. We did label some um, kind of interesting ones that were just highlighted in the paper. Um, so, um, so when we saw this, there was a lot of new information and we didn't know if uh, we wanted to kind of verify it. So um, uh, one of the things we did was we looked at known autism spectrum uh, related phenotypes, um, intellectual disability and, and autism. Um, we collected genes that were associated with those phenotypes like about 100 genes in total. And we did a pathway analysis on those the, those gene lists. Um, and all of the these other uh, like triangles are pathways that are enriched in the intellectual disability genes. And trapezoids are these uh, other shapes that are uh, represent pathways that are enriched in the known autism spectrum disorder genes. And what was interesting was that there was, you know, even though there wasn't a lot of um, uh, overlap between the known disease genes and the genes that were in the pathways that we found, um, the they were frequently enriched in the same pathways. So intellectual disability affected central nervous system development and autism, the, these copy number deletions also affected pathways that are involved in central nervous system development. So that helped kind of um, support the idea that all these new pathways were biologically relevant um, because they're some, somewhat related functionally with uh, known, known disease genes. So um, another interesting, um, so you can kind of zoom in here and see some more details. Um, one interesting thing to note is that uh, when we looked at the genes that were involved in a given pathway, like cell motility, um, the same it wasn't the same gene deleted over and over again in multiple samples. It was different genes in the pathway deleted in different individuals. So, um, you know, you might see that one individual has a, a gene, you know, a cell motility gene. Um, a deleted, and another individual has cell motility B, gene B deleted, and on and on. And eventually, by just kind of combining all that information with a pathway, within the pathway, you can get a strong signal uh, that was not otherwise visible. So if you just looked at the individual genes, you wouldn't see this repeated uh, effect between individuals. But if you looked at the pathway level, you did see this repeated effect between individuals. And that is kind of the key, one of the key concepts, I think, of this workshop is that um, by using prior knowledge like pathways, you can group uh, information and, and make it um, stronger. So we sum up all of the uh, individual counts that would otherwise be associated with an individual gene um, and wouldn't be significant. We sum them all up into a bigger number that ends up being significant. We'll talk about that more later. Um, so feel free to interrupt with any questions that you have. Uh, I'm going to move on to the second example. Uh, which is about ependymoma. So ependymoma is a uh, cancer of the central nervous, nervous system, the ependyma, which is the lining of the central nervous system. And um, this is a project that was led by Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon at Hospital for Sick Children who studies this disease. Um, people had, so so it's, a, it's um, ependymoma in general is one of the more, more common brain tumors in children. Fortunately, brain tumors in children are not that common, but among brain tumors in children, this is one of the more common ones. And for a long time, people have known that it could occur in different anatomical regions in the brain. And um, based on where it occurred, they also knew that it uh, had different outcomes. And in particular, if it occurred in the back of the brain in the posterior fossa, which is the brainstem and the cerebellum, it was the worst possible anatomical location for outcome. Um, and so Michael's lab uh, studied this. Um, and early on, um, just based on looking at gene expression an analysis of uh, all of these posterior fossa pneumoma tumors had determined that there were two subtypes, subtype A, which affected the youngest individuals and has a, has a terrible outcome, and cell type B, which affects the oldest, uh, the older individuals, still children, but had a actually great out, uh, outcome. Um, and uh, so they wanted to look at this more and they did a whole bunch of 
genome sequencing and couldn't find any mutations associated with this disease. So, um, it, you know, mostly when we think of cancer, we uh, think that there's going to be a lot of genetic mutations involved because can one of the hallmarks of cancer is genome instability. In pediatric tumors, it's actually not uh, the same, um, especially early pediatric tumors. There's not a lot of mutations. So, and so, you know, it wasn't so surprising that we didn't find any mutations that were associated with the disease, but um, unfortunately it didn't tell us anything more about the mechanisms involved. So we moved on to DNA methylation, and that was actually very informative. Um, when we looked at DNA methylation, um, there was a very big difference between promoters that were methylated more in the A type, which is the serious subtype, and compared to the B type, which is the less serious subtype. Um, so we the interpretation was that in posterior fossa A, there were about 2,000 genes that were probably transcriptionally silenced by CPG island methylation. And when we looked at the genes involved, they didn't really tell us um, a lot. It was just two, you know, 2,000 genes. It was hard to kind of identify what was common between them. Um, so we did a pathway uh, enrichment analysis, and we found that there was basically just one pathway that was really enriched. And it was, I'll, I'll tell you how we did this a little bit more, but um, it was uh, targets of a PRC2 complex, which is the polychomorepressive complex 2, which um, is involved in um, methylating uh, histones, and then DNA can be methylated in, res uh, in response. Um, what this chart shows is different gene sets. So these are targets of the ED protein, so it's 12 protein, the PRC2 complex, um, and these two proteins are part of this complex. Um, uh, so all of these uh, gene, uh, all of these gene sets are all related. It turns out we're related to the PRC2 complex. This, the length of the bar here is proportional to the significance of how enriched the list of targets were in the 2000 genes that we found to be differentially expressed. And um, everything that is bigger or above this green line was a kind of threshold of the significance that we chose. We considered significant. And there were only a few pathways significant in the A type, and there were no pathways significant in the B type. Um, the way that we plotted these is that we um, converted a p-value. Um, so we'll talk a lot about p-values in the workshop, but basically a low p-value means that there's a uh, is very unlikely for these um, you know targets to be enriched by chance. Um, so that means that it's very significant. Um, but to make it easier to visualize, we take the negative log 10 of the p-value, actually the, the multiple testing correct, corrected p-value, we'll talk about that as well, and um, that converts the p-value into a positive number that is easier to plot on a bar plot. Um, so, uh, the, you know, just to summarize, the take-home message is that everything above this green line is significant, and there was, there was only one real pathway that was coming up, which is this targets of PRC2 complex. Um, and interestingly, um, so so there's no, there was, before this study, there was no known mechanisms that were associated with causing a pneumoma, and there's no treatment other than radiation and uh, surgery. And so uh, there's no targeted drugs or anything like that. So um, we were able to find that a, uh, um, a bunch of chemical probes uh, were available to inhibit the polychomorepressive 2 complex, and that killed posterior fossa A cells uh, specifically in a couple of different models. And because there was no known treatment, it was easy to start a clinical trial, um, you know, nothing to compare to. So um, there's, it turns out there's an on-the-market drug that targets the general process of DNA methylation, and it's called 5-azocytidine. And um, it's originally was developed for blood disorder, um, but because it's safe in the clinic, um, uh, the uh, research team involved and the clinicians were able to get it get it used on compassionate grounds in a patient who had reached the end stage of their um, disease. So this was a, a patient at SickKids who um, uh, is nine years old, who the, his ependymoma had metastasized to the lung. Um, that's this mass here and in two months it doubled in volume and um and so and then at that point there was no other treatment options available uh patient was in the hospital not able to do much um so they applied this azocytidine 
one course of treatment of this azocytidine, azocytidine drug, and that actually stopped the tumor growing for um, 15 months. Uh, and the patient was able to regain their energy and leave the hospital. And that was enough to um, kick off a couple of clinical trials that uh, can test this more generally, also at an earlier stage. And those are those are still, still actually ongoing. Um, they generally show promise. And um, so the nice take home message about this is that um, we were able to kind of the big picture take home messages, we were, we were able to go to knowing nothing about the mechanism of this disease to a drug that was actually had some interesting uh, clinical effect in about two years. Um, and there were a number of links in the chain to go from one to the other, from the raw data, all this data that we collected to that. Um, one of them was identifying the actual genomic data layers that have the information, the interesting information, but also this um, pathway analysis was a, a, an important link. If we didn't have any of those steps, including the pathway analysis, we wouldn't have made the connections that allowed us to identify the, the targets to, to, to study. Um, okay, so um, I am going to switch topics to, um, well, still talking about a penomoma, but um, a different type of pathway analysis. So in this study, um, with uh, uh, a few groups internationally who study a penomoma, they were interested in a molecular classification of all different ependymal tumors, um, including this posterior fossa, one that I mentioned, but there's also others. So they collected data from uh, a whole bunch of different types of tumors, and they uh, clustered them and classified them into nine different subtypes. Um, all these colors here, there's nine, nine subtypes here, posterior fossas, the PF ones, um, and uh, um, and then we did a pathway analysis on each cluster, and then we summarized the whole thing as one of these enrichment maps that we'll learn how to, how to build yourself in the workshop. Um, but the nice thing about this map is it shows an overview of the entire disease in terms of which pathways are affected. Um, so each circle is again a pathway, and we group them into bubbles with just to minimize the number of the amount of text on the screen and make it easier to read. The um, so these big labels are the main types of uh, biological processes that are being affected, and you can just see the colors here. That there's you know the the cyan type of tumor it only affects you know cell stem cell different you know it's only enriched in certain pathways, um, and so there are certain pathways that are unique to specific subtypes. There's other pathways that are present across multiple subtypes, like these ones here, and um, so this, this just gives a really nice overview of the entire space of uh, functional effects that are mechanisms that are likely important in these tumors. Okay, so I have a few more examples. Um, the next one is about single cell RNA-seq. So this was from a study that we were involved in to map the healthy human liver. And we had five um, liver samples uh, we had liver samples from five donors. And um, at the time, this was published in 2018, um, we had we were able to generate around over 8,000 single cell RNA-seq uh, measurements from all these, these samples. And, um, and this was the first liver, healthy liver map that was available. And so we contributed it to the Human Cell Atlas project, which was a big project involving thousands of labs across the world to map all the cells in the human body uh, at single cell resolution. So um, in these studies, the uh, uh, all of this data can usually be grouped and clustered um, and represented as a, a 2D plot. Here, each dot is a cell and the cells are grouped by similarity of their gene expression profiles. And normally what that does is groups cells of the similar type together. So you can see um, hepatocytes are here and um, central venous uh, uh, endothelial cells are here, periportal endothelial cells are here, et cetera. So, um, uh, and, and then this 2D map kind of just summarizes the relationship of all these cells to each other. So 
One of the things that's known in the liver is that um, there's an anatomical gradient as the blood flows through the liver, blood in the liver kind of filters and cleans the blood. Um, and, you know, you know, nutrient and oxygen rich blood comes in one side and, uh, or, you know, actually, um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's gradients of nutrients and also oxygen that occur uh, as the blood flows through the liver from, you know, it coming in, getting processed and then going out. Um, and um, endothelial, uh, a number of different types of cells line, the, line this um, tubing basically that uh, has these gradients and uh, a big chunk of those cells is, are hepatocytes, which are the workhorse of the liver, which have hundreds of functions that um, condition the blood. Uh, and clean things up. So um, one of the things we wanted to do, we identified a number of different hepatocyte cell types or subtypes, and we wanted to um, see how they what how they functioned across this gradient. So we organized uh, the hepatocytes along a gradient that was known. So this gradient was known, was studied in mouse, and people had found the gene expression profiles of hepatocytes along that gradient. And so we organized our cells along that our hepatocytes along that gradient. So we can say we can have periportal on one side and pericentral on the other. Um, and then we did a pathway analysis for each of these hepatocyte groups. And we summarized them again with an enrichment map, these little circle um, diagrams. And I um, uh, forgot to say one thing about enrichment maps, which is that um, the lines between these pathway, these, these circles represent overlap between the uh, the pathways. And, um, and that's actually what helps group similar pathways together. So um, basically, one of the main reasons why we make these is to kind of group similar pathways and reduce the complexity of the pathway enrichment analysis results. Um, so um, here, uh, we can just see that there are different functions that are enriched in different hepatocytes. And so that conclusion for us was that the pathway analysis identifies a specialized functional specialization of hepatocytes across this anatomical structure in the in the, in the human body. Um, okay, so I'm I'm gonna um, go through another example, but it's just a theoretical one, not based on a specific paper, but illustrating an important point that I've mentioned already. But just to see a little bit more how it works, um, let's consider the. Uh, uh, um, a genome-wide association study. So in genome-wide association studies, we collect a bunch of people, we split them into cases and controls, the cases have some phenotype of interest, the controls don't, um, and um, they're usually matched in some way, like age matched. Um, and, the, uh, um, and then we look at the mutations to see if there's a mutation that's associated with the controls the cases and not the controls. So here we have um, a bunch of SNPs and say that we have six SNPs, A to F, and we have a bunch of cases and controls. We have 10 individuals, five cases and five controls. And we look at the SNPs and we say that there's a, a one in the column if that SNP A is present in the cases and a zero or in this individual here and a zero if uh, the SNP is not present or not detected in that individual. And then we can look at these mutations and say, oh, this is really interesting. All the cases are have SNP A and none of the controls have SNP A. So that's a perfect association with the of the SNP A with the cases. Or we can see, you know, vice versa, SNP D is present in all the controls and none of the cases. So that's again perfectly associated, but with the controls. Um, so that's the ideal situation. It'd be great if things were so easy, but actually most of the time um, we see something like this, which is that the case, each case has a different um, mutation. Um, and you know maybe we see, uh, basically every individual has a different mutation. So what do we do now? What can we do with this? Like there is no mutation that's repeated. We can't say anything. Like we've done all this work and and it looks like we have to throw the results out because there's no information. So any ideas? Mutations might fall in the same pathway. Yeah, so that's a good idea. Any, okay, so that that's that's the answer. So if we organize the mutations, the if we link the SNPs to genes and we organize the um, SNPs by uh, 
if we organize those genes by pathways, we can collapse all of that information. So we collapse all of these ones here. Let's say we find that they're all part of the same pathway. We collapse them down into a pathway uh, row. Um, and so now we save the project because um, now we see a really strong association between our pathway. It turns out all those SNPs were involved in uh, pathway apoptosis. And, um, and so we see that apoptosis was uh, affected in all the cases and none of the controls. So, um, you know, the way that that works, so, you know, we didn't just magically create information. The way that, that it works is that um, because we knew that that those genes are part of that pathway, that's important information, that's prior knowledge. And, um, and that helps us, uh, it can increase statistical power by two ways. So one is that we aggregate the counts. So instead of having one count per SNP, and we can't really do much with that, we now have five counts per pathway um, without doing any extra measurements. Um, and so that aggregation of all those ones into a bigger number of five is, helps increase the power. And we also reduce multiple testing because instead of having to run tests with each SNP individually, we now run tests with just one pathway in this case. Um, of course, there'll be more. There'll be more pathways in the real analysis, but the um, uh, there'll generally be fewer pathways than SNPs. Um, and we'll talk about that multiple testing a lot later. Um, and the other interesting thing, so that increases statistical power via those two ideas. Um, the other useful thing is that it generates a mechanistic hypothesis. We now can suggest that apoptosis is related to the case phenotype. Whereas before we'd say SNP A is related to the case phenotype, and well, that doesn't tell me as much. I'd have to go do extra work to figure out what that means mechanistically. Okay, so here's another example, just quickly. Um, you know, what if what um, what do let's say we study uh, gene expression differences between two conditions, and we find a thousand genes that are differently expressed. What do they have in common? Well, we might find that they're all known targets of a transcription factor or a microRNA. And so um, if th they would then be the, the, they would be, then be enriched in targets of that transcription factor. And then we might be able to say that that transcription factor is explaining this pattern. It's upregulating these genes and activating these genes and repressing these genes. Um, and so that might give us again a mechanistic hypothesis to work with. Okay, so just to summarize the benefits of pathway analysis and uh, more generally network analysis versus analyzing individual transcripts or proteins or SNPs by themselves is that we work with uh, easier to, it's generally easier to interpret because we're working with familiar concepts um, and improves statistical power through this aggregation and reduction, reduction of multiple testing. Um, it identifies possible causal mechanisms um, and um, a couple of other things that I didn't really explain by through these examples, but it turns out that it's usually more re reproducible because let's say we do gene, you know, we collect gene expression data from different samples in different labs, and we look at the genes that are differentially expressed. Well, it's not always the case that the differentially expressed genes agree, but then it's more likely that the pathways that they relate to would agree. Um, people have found that. Um, and it also can facilitate integrating multiple different data types because you can do pathway analysis for each genomic data type separately. And then because they're all, uh, the pathway analyses are all um, working with the same information of pathways, you can put all that data together at the pathway level. Um, okay, so in this workshop, we'll be going over a lot of, a good chunk of the workshop, we'll be covering this general workflow where we collect genomics data, we normalize and score it, uh, like we compute differential gene expression, that generates a gene list, and then we analyze it to learn more about the cellular mechanism using pathway and network analysis. And this um, pathway network analysis is kind of broken down into, um, you know, once we have some pathways that are interesting, we look at them and figure out what's, which ones are interesting. Once we find one that's interesting, we study it more closely. That's drilling down to understand more about molecular mechanism. And ideally that would lead to a publishable result. Um, going into a little bit more detail, we have a lot of different types of genomic data and each one has its own way of scoring. Um, we don't, we're not going to cover the different ways of scoring and, um, you know, converting the raw genomics data into 
gene list, for instance, but one thing that they generally have in common, all of these, is that they can result in a gene list, which then we want to interpret. Um, and then, you know, I talked a lot about pathway analysis. This is the this box is, you know, referring to different methods that help us identify interesting pathways. Um, we can also identify interesting networks, which we'll learn about. Um, and then this is the mechanistic drill down. So all of these little um, boxes here uh, reference software tools, analysis tools that are and visualization tools that um, you can use to do these steps. And we'll be covering a lot of these in the, in the lecture. So we'll come back to this over and over again. Um, but um, this kind of summarizes the, the big um, picture view. Uh, okay, so um, that's basically it. So we'll, you know, just to kind of link what I've talked to you about to the workshop topics, um, we'll start by covering a lot of uh, details about pathway enrichment analysis, starting with your gene list of interest and doing all the types of analyses that uh, result in this, these nice visuals that we showed. Um, and uh, there's also um, network analysis, which I didn't talk about too much, but we'll talk more about um, in the in the workshop. And this uh, can help with um, uh, identifying interesting biological processes that we might not know about in the pathway databases. Um, so um, just a kind of quick preview is that the advantage of pathways is that we know a lot about pathways. Um, and when we identify a pathway, it's easy for us to understand. Um, the disadvantage of pathways is that they don't cover all of the genes in the genome. Um, most of the genes in the genome are not linked to a pathway. So we're still learning about all the genes in the genome of any genome that you're studying. Um, on the other hand, network analysis uh, uses networks of relationships between genes that might come from a lot of different places. We know genes are functionally related. Uh, we can um, you know, uh, identify sets of functionally related genes that might represent pathways or genes that are working together. Um, the advantage of that is that generally it has a more unbiased view of the genome because a lot of the data comes from high throughput studies. Uh, the disadvantage is that once you find a network, you have to kind of understand, interpret it a little bit because it doesn't have an, might not have a nice label like a, a pathway. So, um, uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll also talk about different types of network analysis, including um, predicting the function of genes that you don't know much about. Like you might find a gene that comes out of your experiment and actually people don't know about it, but looking in these network databases, you might get some clues about its function. And finally, we're gonna, uh, new for this year, uh, this workshop, we're gonna, um, we've extended the uh, network analysis to an interesting area uh, that's becoming more popular from single cell genomics, which is cell-cell communication analysis. So if you have single cell genomics data, you can look at, you can infer a network of cell, cell communication relationships from this data. Um, and uh, Gregory Schwartz will talk about that. Um, okay, so so that is uh, it for the intro. Um, any general questions? Yeah? What happens in your, in your case if the gene list is too short? So if the gene list is too short, so one of the things that you might find is that you don't get any genes that are identified from your experiment. Um, so that's a troubleshooting case. Um, if the gene lists are too, if the gene list, I, I don't think you can say the gene list is too short, but if the, if you don't have a lot of genes, um, let's say you get one gene at the minimum. So the minimum is really zero, but I think if you don't get any genes, then you can say, well, what happened? And you might troubleshoot your experiment. Um, it's possible that it's really, you know, genes are differentially expressed, but most of the time we do find some genes that are differentially, differentially expressed. If the list is short, you, you don't need pathway analysis. You can look them up manually and and if they're if you trust that those genes are correct and that's correctly a short list then you can just you know review it manually so this pathway and network analysis is more useful for um, the uh, cases where you have lots of genes and it would be too long you'd save a huge amount of time by doing it in an automated way compared to manually doing everything um, but there are some interesting cases where uh, you don't get, um, a good enough signal from your results, like 
one that we see we've seen a number of times is if you're looking at differential gene expression and you don't get a lot of differentially expressed genes. Um, usually, the big reason for that is that the um, there's a lot of variability in the in the um, uh, data. So let's say we have three of condition A versus three samples from the controls, and we measure the gene expression for each gene across each sample, and then we can do a t-test to compare the differential expression between the three measurements that we made of gene A and the condition versus the controls. And we get a pretty big standard deviation, a big spread of information. You're not going to be able to get a very good um, um, uh, measurement of how differentially expressed they are. So you probably need to get more samples or somehow figure out where that variability is coming from. Um, sometimes you can do an RNA-seq experiment and you get really low counts. And there's a number of reasons for that, but one reason is that you use the wrong genome annotation file and didn't work, right? So you have to go back and check, you know, your settings on how you count everything from your single your RNA seq experiment. So those are the kind of things that happen in the um in this in this area, this region here, where you've collected the data and you you've process you're processing it. Um, and we're not going to really cover that, but we know a lot about those types of things. So if you have any specific questions, we can answer them. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, so that's that's generally part of this idea that, you know, if you don't have good results here, you won't get good results here. Um, and, and sometimes you can troubleshoot and improve things. Other times, rarely uh, we've found, but sometimes you have to redo the experiment. Any other questions? Okay, so um, uh, great. So um, I'm not going to be here for, I'll stick around for a bit, but I'm not going to be here for some of the later sections, but uh, Ruth, Veronique, and Chaitra uh, have been involved uh, with analyzing this data a lot and building these tools, um, and also Lincoln and uh, Gregory Schwartz, who will come later, um, build some of these tools as well. So um, ask your questions. Um, there's a, a lot of expertise in uh, this uh, um, uh, available for you in the workshop. Okay, great. So, um, so I think that means that we are on a break.